chapter 18 is where we'll be today, Matthew chapter 18, if you'd like to go there this morning and follow along. And as you're turning there, I'd like to ask you a question this morning, uh, very basic, very simple question, but let's see if you can get it. Um, in the Bible, does God call the church, does he say it's like a family or that the church is a family? You're ahead of the game. The Word of God says that the church is a family. Not as just like a family, but it is a family. It's the spiritual family of God, right? Once we trust in Jesus Christ as our Savior, we become blood brothers and blood sisters in Christ. Because of the blood of Jesus, we now are relatives as a spiritual family of God. And I want you to keep that in mind today as we go through the Word of God. We're continuing our series called Judge Not, right? You hear that so often in today's world, and you hear it thrown out there when anybody says anything to anybody about anything, right? But God has called us really to discern and to judge, especially within the church. So I don't want you to get the wrong impression this morning because we're speaking mainly, if you're here for the first time, we're speaking mainly about our church family this morning and making sure that we're taking care of one another. Matthew chapter 18 we started looking at this last week. If you were here last week, raise your hand real quick. All right. So y'all might have your notes from last week. We're continuing in those notes, but we're going to do a really quick review. Okay. Just to get everything in your notes this morning, we're going to do a quick review of what's going on here in Matthew chapter 18. It's basically called this. It's called church discipline. Just like a healthy family needs discipline. A church family needs discipline as well. In verse 15, it says this of Matthew chapter 18. Jesus is speaking and he says this. If your brother sins, go and show him his fault in private. If he listens to you, you have won your brother. Let's stop there for a moment and go to the Lord in prayer. Father, we ask that you would speak to us this morning. We ask that your word would simply do what it does, Lord, and that your spirit would use it to convict where conviction needs to take place. God, to encourage as we need an encouragement this morning. And God, that you would just shape us into the church that you want us to be. A family who loves you and serves you and loves one another enough to say something. God, we pray that you would be glorified. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Jesus is saying a few things here. The first thing he says is if, you're, if, you, if your brother sins against you, okay? And sometimes people say, well, this is only regulated to one thing. This is only regulated to when someone sins against you. But the context is much broader than that. Okay, We need to understand that this morning. He's speaking of sin in general. When anyone within the church is blatantly, unrepentantly sinning over and over. And you know about it. That's the context into which he is speaking. He's speaking to disciples. What's a disciple? A disciple is simply a follower of Jesus Christ. So if you are a follower of Jesus Christ this morning, Jesus is speaking to you in this passage. He's also speaking of fellow Christians. He says, if your brother, he's not speaking of your physical, biological brother. He's speaking of your spiritual brother or sister, mom, dad, your spiritual family. He's speaking of the church of Christ. And then, of course, we mentioned this already. He's speaking specifically about sin. He's speaking about sin in the life of a believer. Sin that is unrepentant, continued, unconfessed, blatant sin. Okay? Just to be clear, that is what he's speaking about. So we're just going to quickly review the first two points this morning. The first one we see is this. This is what we're to do in the church family. When we see a brother or sister in sin, rebuke them privately. Rebuke him or her privately. We don't shout it from the mountaintops. Did you see what so-and-so did? Hey, why don't you cut that sin out, right? We don't do that. When you see a brother or sister in sin, you go to them in private so as not to embarrass them. And you speak to them in love and show them their sin. We said that this is there's three aspects. The first aspect was privately. The second aspect was specifically. 
you want to get detailed, as uncomfortable as this is, when you see a brother or sister in your family, in your church family, sinning, you want to go to them and say, hey, I see that you're committing adultery, right? Just for example. And you show them by the word of God what God says. So that way they can't come back at you and say, stop judging me. Mind your own business, right? Anybody ever heard that? Mind your own business. You see, when we're a family, your business is my business. Amen. And if we truly care for one another, then we'll go to a person in love and confront them about the sin in their life in private. And specifically, last week, we shared this powerful scripture in Hebrews 4, 12. Love, love, love this verse. Here's what it says. It says, the word of God is quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword. Piercing even to the dividing asunder of the soul and spirit and the joints and marrow. It is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. And we said this phrase. We said that the word of God goes where you can't. See, a lot of times we want to get judgmental. And we want to go to somebody and tell them, hey, listen, this is what you're doing wrong. And this is what I see. And this is what I think you should do. And I just really believe that if you did this. And the problem with that, we said, is one word. It's the word I. But when we go to them with the word of God and we show them in love and in private what the word of God says, the word of God goes where you and I can't go. It splits the flesh. It splits the very soul of man. And it gets down deep to convict. It convicts when you and I can't convict. You and I are not the Holy Spirit. Amen. amen. And so when you use the word of God to confront somebody in sin, it's powerful and sharp and goes where you can't go. Amen. Let the word of God do what the word of God does. And then we said, lastly, we are to rebuke with an attitude of reconciliation, reconciliatory. It simply means tending to reconcile. It's not, I'm better than you and you need to get in the shape. You need to get this worked out. You need, come on, come on. You're slack. You're leaving everybody. Come on. You're really messing up the church. I'm so disappointed. It's not with that type of attitude. It's with the attitude that says, hey, your sin has broken fellowship with God and with other believers. And it's beginning to hurt people and it's going to hurt and bring you down. And it's with a, gen a tender heart and a, and a heart that says, I love you, that you go to that person and you try to get them to reconcile with God and with other people. To repent from their sin. See, the goal of confrontation is restoration. That's worth writing down. Amen. The goal of confrontation is restoration. Restoration of the relationship with them and God and restoration of the relationship with you and them. Because when sin enters the picture, it always breaks up relationships. You know that to be true. You've seen it in your own life and in the life of others. Perhaps you've gone through a divorce or know someone that has. There's a reason that God hates divorce. There's a reason that God hates sin in general. I'm not just going to pick on divorcees. But there's a reason that God hates sin. It's because it breaks our fellowship with him and with our family in Christ. So we are to go with an attitude of reconciliation. And I want you to do something this morning. If you're with me, say amen. amen. I want you to repeat after me this phrase. Don't do it yet. I want you to take accountability for what we're saying today. If you're a believer in Christ and you're part of this family or a family anywhere in terms of a church, this is your responsibility. So you need to say with me, I am responsible. Would you say that with me? I am responsible. You're responsible for confronting in love, for rebuking in love, for telling someone in private specifically with an attitude of reconciliation. Here's your sin. I don't want to see you hurt yourself or other people or damage your relationship with God. First point pretty clear. Amen. Amen. We got that down. Let's move on to the second point. Number two, return with witnesses. Sounds like CSI or something, right? Crime scene investigation. You see, they're going to respond one way or another to you. Either they're going to listen to you or they're going to say probably something like, mind your own business, right? So either they're going to listen to you or they're not going to listen to you. If they don't listen to you, Jesus tells us to go back to them 
with more people. Look at verse number 16 of Matthew chapter 18. He says, but if he does not listen to you, take one or two more with you so that by the mouth of two or three witnesses, every fact may be confirmed. You take others back with you if they are unrepentant. Why? Why witnesses? Why go through this step? It seems kind of drastic in a lot of ways. First of all, for progress, progress in the rest reconciliation process, right? You, you, you say, well, Dave, that, that doesn't sound right. You see, there's such a thing as positive peer pressure. How many of you have ever experienced negative peer pressure? Raise your hand real loud. Probably every single person in here, right? But, you know, there can be positive peer pressure. And in the family of God, there should be positive peer pressure. And that comes when multiple people come back after a person is unrepentant, in sin, and they love and they still in private, okay? Still in private, go to that person and say, here's where you're erring. Here's where you are sinning. It's for the ultimate hope that they will restore their relationship with God and with other people. It's also for protection. For protection, protection for you and for the accused. How many of you have been falsely accused in your life? Doesn't that's not fun, is it? Sometimes you feel powerless, right? And so Jesus says, listen, in the family of God, to protect each individual member, when someone sins, you need to go to them privately, let them try to either explain themselves, maybe something was off, maybe it looked like it was something, but it wasn't. But if they're still sinning and they're unrepentant, go with them to them with more people, one or two others, to confirm, the Bible says, every fact. Confirm every fact. It's for their protection as well as your protection. And then lastly, it's for proof. Proof of the sin as well as rebuking of the sin. Proof that you went to that person. Because they could easily say, you never came to me and said anything. You never told me I was in sin, right? Because there's more steps to come. But you can't go through step three and step four until you do step one, which is privately confront them. You bring others in step number two, and then you have proof that you went to them. So you rebuke them privately. You rebuke them with an attitude of reconciliation. If they refuse, you bring back witnesses. So here's where we're at. That was all of last week's lesson, right? Everybody got that firm in your head, amen? Amen. You ready for step three and step four? Because it's about to get juicy. It's about to get like, you mean Jesus really said to do that? You mean Jesus really wants us to actually do this? It's important to know that this is not a church manifestation. This is not something the church came up with. This is not something Pastor Dave came up with. This is the words of Jesus Christ for his church. Amen? Amen. And so we would, it would behoove ourselves to understand it and to abide by it. Step one, rebuke them privately. Step two, return with witnesses. They still aren't listening to you. They still refuse to repent. Here's what you do. Number three, rebuke him publicly before the church. Now, you're not going to be able to drag them up on stage, and I wouldn't suggest you do that anyways. But their name and what they're caught in should be brought before the church. To rebuke them publicly before the church. You see the progression. We started out privately, now we're public. And it's all for the intent of reconciliation. It's not to embarrass them. It's not to condemn them, to judge them, to scorn them. It's so that they, as a family member, will come back into the family. We don't want you to be outside the family. We want you inside the family. But when you're sinning, you're purposely breaking your fellowship with God and breaking your fellowship with other believers. And so we want you back inside the family. It's for progress. We've said this multiple times. For progress. Progress. What does progress look like in church discipline? It looks like reconciliation with God and with your church family. It's them repenting and turning and saying, you're right. I'm sorry for my sin. I can't believe how stupid I've been. I don't want to do that anymore. Let's go back. Let's get in fellowship with God and with the church. It's for progress. The hope is that the thought of the entire church being made aware of the individual sin 
would encourage that person to repent. In a nutshell, here's the reason. It's to turn the sinner from their sin. You see, that's what love looks like. The world will look on and say, wow, that's judgment. No, that's love. And that's what Christ has commanded us to do. And again, let me take a sidestep here and just say this. We're not talking about every little bitty sin, right? I saw you break the speed limit last week. I'm not your door. Not, not, not. We would have a never-ending job. We're not trying to create a police state at our church. What we are trying to do is when someone is in egregious sin that is about to bring them down and other people down around them, we want to rescue them, reconcile them to God and with the church family. Amen. But not only is it for progress, it's for proper judgment. It's for proper judgment. See, unfortunately in our day and age, just like in the day and age of Jesus and specifically within the Corinthian church, we're about to look at a scripture in 1 Corinthians. There were some problems going on with believers suing other believers, threatening to sue other believers within the church. And I want to look at 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verses 1 and 2. Look at it. It's on the screen. If you follow along as I read it aloud, it says this. Paul is speaking. He's speaking to the Corinthian church. And he says, if any of you has a legal dispute against another do you dare go to court before the unrighteous? He says, are you seriously going to go to the law? Are you seriously going to go before a secular judge in a court system? And then he says, and not before the what? Saints. What's the implication? Paul is saying, listen, when you have a dispute with somebody else in the church, when you feel like they've sinned against you, when, when conflict arises in the church, don't go gossip about it. Don't go to the law. Don't go to your friend who's not a believer at your work, at your, at your job. No, it's to go before the church. All right, we'll just keep going. I'll get louder. Is that all right? Amen. Amen. All right. I don't think that's God that wants me to stop this morning. I think it's the other way. We'll just keep going. And there it goes. Got a little bit here. Got a little bit there. All right. We good? Don't worry about it on the screen. I'll give you notes. All right. Um, I'm going to train you real quick. It's for proper judgment. So 1 Corinthians chapter 6, basically Paul is saying, listen, we don't go before the courts. We go before the church. Thank you, brother. We go before this, the church. Disputes, conflicts, sin amongst believers should be resolved with the local body of believers. You know what's crazy? I got I to tell you this this morning. This is good. So a couple nights ago, uh, I woke up and I just, I had, I don't know if it was an epiphany or just a part of the dream that I was dreaming, but I dreamed that, you know, that God was saying, here's what I want you to do. And I thought it was part of my next message series, but it might be part of this series. Uh, I said, I want, he said, I want you to shut everything down. Take away the sound. Take away the music. Take away the lights, you know, a little bit of lights. Okay, we're back on. He said, he said I, want you, I want you to do all that. And I didn't hear a, ver a verbal auditory voice, okay? But I just, I had a, a vision or a dream or epiphany with that. And, and here we are. <laughs> and God's servant does, doesn't obey. God does it anyways, right? Because all we need is the word of God in our church. Yeah. That's right. Yeah. As believers in Jesus Christ, here, here's the thing, folks. I think that the enemy knows that when church discipline happens... It proves and provides a healthy church. When's the last time you heard about church discipline happening? Have you ever? And yet Christ himself says that we should be doing this. Because God wants a pure church. I'm getting ahead of myself in the notes here. But, but God wants a church that is holy and pure before him. He has given us the things that we need in our culture, in our society. We have been blessed with many, many things, with technology and lights and sound and, and all these things. And they're good things and they should be used. But sometimes we rely on those things a little bit too much. And God says, listen, you just need the church family, my spirit and my word. Amen. Let's continue on this morning. Praise God for him teaching us a lesson within a lesson. Amen. 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 Proper judgment. 
You see, the attitude must be in love with great sadness. Imagine this. Imagine you're caught in a city. And you want to get out, perhaps. How effective and how powerful would it be to know if somebody comes to you and they say, hey, I noticed this sin in your life. And you can tell they're sincere and they love you and they just don't want you to hurt yourself. But you're still stuck in the sin and they say, and you say to them, no, 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 just, just leave me alone. I'll be all right, right? And then they come back with a couple more. And you see, man, they really do care. This must be really awkward and uncomfortable for them, right? But you still, you just love your sin too much and you say, you know what, I'm stuck. Just get lost. I don't want to hear. But then you hear that the next step that they're going to take is to bring you before the church. Think about that for a moment. To bring you before the church. And you think about them and what that looks like. And you hear that they're meeting today. And they're going to talk about what's going on in your life. And they're caring for you and they're loving for you. And you hear after the service what happened. You hear that there was weeping over you. And people were crying out to God that you would come back into the fellowship. That you would repent from your sin. Imagine what that would feel like. It feels like family. Amen? Amen. Amen. And it's not a feeling of condemnation. It's a feeling of they care enough to say something to me. To go to the extreme. To obey what Christ demands. To tell me, hey, you're going to hurt yourself. Don't do this anymore. It's a good feeling. It's a great feeling to know that your church family loves you that much. That they're willing to risk the relationship to save you from your sin. To keep you from hurting yourself. Listen, listen. And others. Because sin always affects others. Would you say that loudly with me? Sin always affects others. It always affects people around you. You can try to fool yourself and kid yourself and say, no, 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 this is a private sin. Nobody knows. Listen, it's going to affect somebody else. That's the nature of sin. God says, listen, you're to bring it before the church. It's for proper judgment. Number three is for protection of the Lord's name. For protection of the Lord's name. You say, hey, why does God's name need to be protected at all? He's God, right? But you think about what was happening in that church, and maybe someone has threatened you with a lawsuit as a believer, even another believer. What is happening in that scenario with the outside world? Here's what's happening. The world is looking at the church and looking at the conflict and looking at one believer trying to sue another believer and saying, you can't even do what God commands you to do. And it drags the name of Christ through the mud. It's a shame in our approach on the name of Jesus when believers can't work things out amongst ourselves within our own family. That we would have to go to the outside world, the court system, to take care of conflicts within the church is ungodly and unbiblical. And God says, listen, it's profaning my name in that way. So, with that all in mind, you go to them privately. They refuse to listen. You bring a few more back, and you tell them, and they refuse to listen. You tell them, now here's what we're going to do. We're going to lovingly bring your name before the church and tell people what's going on in your life so that we can weep and pray over you and so that you'll come back into the fellowship and to, to reconcile with God. And they still say, nope. Doesn't matter to me. What do you do then? What's the next step? Jesus gives us the next step. Verse 17, he says, if he refuses to listen to them, tell it to the church. That was step three. Here's step four. And if he refuses to listen even to the church, let him be to you as a Gentile and a tax collector. Here's step number four. Remove him from the fellowship of the church. We're not talking about physically, okay? We're talking about removing them from an interaction that only a family has. How I many of y'all think family's important? Maybe one of the most important things, right? One of the greatest things that God ever established. Did you know God established a family? Right. That's why he has the right to say what a family is and what a family is not. Because the family is from God. But just like he has established the earthly family, the human family, he has established the family of God. 
is who he has the right to dictate and to say what's to happen in the family of God. And he says, when a believer, listen, a believer, not an unbeliever, when a believer starts acting in sin and is unrepentant and continues down that road and you've done step one, step two, step three, guess what step four is? Get them out. Break the fellowship with that individual. It says, let him be to you as a Gentile and a tax collector. What does that mean to us? We're like, what, what do you mean? I don't like tax collectors, so there's that, right? He's basically saying if, if they're acting like an unbeliever, listen, treat them like an unbeliever. The implication here is this. Who is the church made for and made up of? It's believers. The church is to consist of believers. Now, we're never going to say to an unbeliever that comes through those doors, you get out, right? But the true church is not a building. It's not even the Sunday morning service. The true church is a family of believers. we got a lot of churches out there that are amounting great masses of people. Listen, that's not the church. Just because somebody comes into a building and listens to a message and goes home, that doesn't mean they're a part of a church. And some of you are coming to our church, coming to this building, thinking you're a part of the church, but you're not a part of the church because you're not a part of the fellowship. You're not a part of the family. You know your family when you start caring about the other people in these pews. Maybe you just come and you listen and you go home. Man, that was a good sermon. Yeah, I'm going to live for Christ. That's good. But you could care less about the other people in this church. You're not a part of the church. The true church is a family, and a family sacrifices for one another, Amen. puts up with one another, yes. cares about one another, yes. loves one another. Does this sound familiar? Over and over and over in the New Testament, you hear one another, one another, one another. That's the church family. Amen. So it makes sense that when a brother or sister in Christ is in sin, you turn a blind eye to them, that's not love. You see, God wants us to lovingly bring people back into the fellowship, believers back into the fellowship. We're going to go to one more scripture this morning. I'd like you to turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 5. 1 Corinthians chapter 5, we're, gonna, we're almost done. You know, in retrospect, I don't think all that going off was God saying you didn't obey me. I think it was saying that day's coming when that's all we're going to do. We're just going to have the Bible and the Word and you and singing. And we're going to put all this stuff aside. And we're going to have a service that's just a natural service. And all we need is God, our family fellowship, and the Word and His Spirit. Amen? Amen. That day's coming, so look forward to that. But as you're turning, 1 Corinthians chapter 5. You say, you're saying at this point, Dave, this sounds crazy. That Jesus would even say that we're supposed to go through these steps for real. That we should take him literally. This sounds crazy. But look what happens in 1 Corinthians chapter 5. In verse number 1, we're going to read verses 1 through 13. Paul is speaking again. He says this. If you're there, say amen. amen. He says, it is actually reported that there is immorality among you. He's about to get specific. And immorality of such a kind as does not exist even among the Gentiles. Listen to the sin. He names it. That someone has his father's wife. That is, someone is sleeping with his father's wife. That is, possibly his mother or at the, word, at the, the least, the best case scenario, his mother-in-law. It's disgusting sin. Paul says in verse 2, you have become arrogant. And have not mourned instead, so that the one who had done this deed would be removed from your midst. Verse 3, for I, on my part, though absent in the body, but present in spirit, have already judged him who is, has so committed this as though I were present. Paul says, listen, I'm not there, but if I was, I'd be doing the same thing I'm doing right now. I'm judging that person and telling you what to do about him. Verse 4. In the name of our Lord Jesus, when you are assembled, and I with you in spirit, with the power of our Lord Jesus, I have decided to deliver such a one to Satan for the destruction of his flesh. Why? So that his spirit may be saved in the day of the Lord Jesus. It's ultimately for that person's benefit, Paul says. 
Verse 6, your boasting is not good. They were saying, oh, it's okay. They were turning a blind eye to sin, talking about God's grace and God's love and God's grace and God's love and God's grace and God's love till it was sickening and they were allowing sin in the church. Does that sound familiar? We have too many churches that are just saying, just come on in. Don't worry about your sin. That's not the church of the New Testament. Verse 7, clean out the old leaven so that you may be a new lump, just as you are in fact unleavened. For Christ, our Passover, also has been sacrificed. What in the world? He starts talking about bread. <laughs> right? He starts talking about bread. How many of you guys are bakers? Ladies, oh, Jay, I saw your hand. Who is this, man? <laughs> oh, no, he's a he cook. Okay, there's a, there is a difference, all right? He starts talking about bread, and he says, clean out the old leaven so that you may have a new lump, just as you are, in fact, unleavened. For Christ, our Passover, also has been sacrificed. Verse 8, therefore, let us celebrate the feast, not with old leaven, nor with the leaven of malice and wickedness, but with the unleavened bread of sincerity and truth. Verse 9, I wrote you in my letter not to associate with the immoral people. Now listen, this is important because he makes a very clear distinction. Verse 10, I did not at all mean with the immoral people of this world or with the covetous and swindlers or with idolaters. For then you would have to go out of the world. Paul says, listen, I'm not talking about, I'm not saying you can't have communication and friendship with people that are outside of the church with unbelievers. He's saying then you'd have to leave the planet. Instead, he says in verse 11, but actually I wrote to you not to associate with any so-called brother if he is an immoral person or covetous or an idolater or a reviler or a drunkard or a swindler, not even to eat with such one. Wow! He says, Paul says, listen to the church. He says, listen, I'm not saying you can't have contact and friendship and communication with unbelievers. He's saying, I don't want you to have contact, friendship and communication with believers who are in sin. Don't eat with them. That's pretty strong language. Why? Verse 12, for what have I to do with judging outsiders? Do you not judge those who are within the church, but those who are outside God judges? And then he says this very powerful statement at the end of verse 13. Remove the wicked man from among yourselves. Here's the reason that this is such a serious matter. And this is the reason that God wants you to, after the first three steps, remove from the fellowship that person that is unrepentant sin. The first reason is this. They're acting like an unbeliever. And it brings reproach and shame and disgrace on the name of Christ. That's the very first reason. The second reason is this. The holiness and the purity of the church is a serious matter to God. When there's sin in the camp, the Lord cannot bless some of you are in sin, you're unrepentant, and you don't realize it, but it's preventing the power of God in our church. It's preventing the Spirit of God to work in our midst and to reach unbelievers. And you are so selfish because you're holding on to your sin. And what you don't realize is one of the casualties is the family of God doesn't have the power of God. Paul says to this church, and he says to us, remove the sin first. Try to get that person to repent, but if they will not, remove them from the church. Here's the bottom line. The person is unrepentant, continuing to sin. You've gone to them in private. You've gone to them with multiple people. You've brought them before the church, and they still won't repent. Here's the bottom line. Fellowship is to be intentionally broken. Fellowship is to be intentionally broken. Why? Why such drastic measures? Anybody else besides me think this is pretty harsh? Go ahead, raise your hand. Let's be honest. This is pretty intense, harsh stuff, right? Why such drastic measures? There's one word. And you already know it. Some of you are thinking it already. And you've seen it throughout the text. Here's the one word. Love. 
your son or your daughter or your family member is hurting themselves and hurting the rest of the family, the appropriate action to take is discipline. Discipline to protect them and to protect the family. And we said at the beginning of this message, we are a spiritual family. If someone is hurting themselves and hurting other believers, it is because of love that we reach out to them and try to get them to reconcile to God and to one another. It's love for your brother or sister in Christ. It's for restoration of the believer. It's for love for the church, for the purity of the church. And it's for love of the Lord. Jesus said, if you love me, you'll keep my commandments. Is this a command? Absolutely, it's a command. It's one the church has forsaken for far too long. Last week I did mention, if a believer is confronted, and at any stage, stage one, stage two, stage three, they repent, they're not, listen, they're not to be held at arm's length. They're to be fully embraced as a part of the family of God. I don't care what they've done. If they're sincerely repentant, they don't want to sin anymore. They want to be reconciled to God and to the church. You bring them back into the family and you love them just as Christ loves them. Amen? Amen. So what's the out outcome? What's the practical implication? I want to give you three things that are not on your notes, okay? They're not on your notes, so I want you just to write these either on the back or somewhere, and then we'll be done this morning. This should serve, like last week, as a warning. John MacArthur has a great quote. He says, Christians can become ministers of holiness only as they themselves are holy. You see, the natural inclination for everybody in here is to look around and be like, okay, who's sinning? <laughs> right? And what Jesus would say, as we talked about earlier in the study, is you first need to do this. Where is the sin in my life? You get the plank out of your eye, and then you try to help someone remove the speck in theirs. It's this. Number one, an application. Look within. Look within. Search yourself this morning to see if there is sin in your life. We're here to help you, not condemn you. If there is a sin that you are stuck in and you want out, come see me. We will work through the word of God. You didn't get in there easy. It's not going to be getting out of easy, all right? That ain't proper English, but, but that's all right. You know what I'm saying. Number two, look around. At some point, you need to look at your family. And if there's somebody in sin, you need to confront them in love and in private. You need to look around. And at the bottom of your paper, there's a blank. It's an extra blank. I don't think it's on the screen. And maybe you can write that person's name in that blank. Hey, if they're sitting right by you, don't write their name in, in that finger, right? You're like, it's my husband. No, don't do that. Just get it in your head, right? But write it down and then make it a point. See, last week we talked about a lot of the same things. But what I know happens to me as well as to you is we hear from the Word of God. We agree with the Word of God. We say amen and then we go out and nothing happens. See, God wants you to take steps of action. And if you didn't do it last week, God's given you not another opportunity this week. Look within, look around, and then lastly, look to join a family. Look to join a family. You say, what do you mean, Dave? I already have a family. Do you have a spiritual family? Do you have a local body of believers that you are a part of? If you don't, we would love to have you here. We're a bunch of sinners saved by the grace of God. Actually, we're saints now because of Christ and his blood. We'll take you in, faults and all, we'll love on you. And yes, when push comes to shove, if there's sin in your life, we'll confront you lovingly about it for your benefit because we love you. Do you have a family? Are you investing in the local church? You say, yeah, Dave, I've been coming to Cornerstone for a while now. No, that's not what I asked. Are you part of this family? Are you involved? Are you invested? Are you engaged? Do you come to small group classes on Sunday morning? Do you come to a movie on the lawn? Well, I don't like that movie. Well, maybe it's not about you. Right? Amen? Amen. I hope God's working in our hearts this morning. If God is working in your heart, 
and he's doing something to convict you of sin, you need to deal with that today. The tendency is to say, I'll deal with it tomorrow, next week, next month. Deal with that sin today. Maybe you know someone who is in this church that you love very dearly that is in sin. Confront them privately. Show them their sin. Maybe God is telling you you need to join a church family, whether it's here or somewhere else. You will never survive as a Christian if you're not a part of the Christian family. Would you bow your heads? Every head bowed, every eye closed. As we're about to sing a song of worship here, I just want to get, give you an opportunity this morning. Maybe you say, Dave, the message really spoke to my heart. I don't know what it was that God spoke to you about, but he spoke to you about something. Would you just raise your hand if God spoke to you this morning real high, real unashamed. Thank you, hands up all over the building. Now, here's my challenge to you. Act on what God has spoken to you about. Maybe you're here today and you've never trusted in Jesus Christ. You say, Dave, I'm not sure. I feel like maybe there's someone in here that just says, I, I, I've learned a lot today, but I don't know about this Christianity. I don't know about Jesus. I don't know about these things. Would you at least take the next step to seeing who Jesus really is? And maybe today you're ready to take the full step and trust him as your Lord and Savior. Pursue those steps. As the Spirit of God calls you, don't ignore his voice. Father God, we thank you for all you've done today, for your word. Showing, you, showing us that you are in charge. God, that it's you that we should be glorifying and praising and lifting up. And we thank you, God, that you have spoken to of your church. Help us to remember we're a family. That we're called upon to act in love even when it's uncomfortable. We thank you, Lord, for what you've done and what you're about to do. It's in the precious name of Jesus I pray these things. Amen. Jesus' blood and righteousness I dare not trust the sweetest friend